Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the news channel. I'm very privileged to have back on the show Dr. Mark Faber. He is the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Gloom <laughs> and Doom Report, which can be found at gloomboomdoom.com. I highly recommend you subscribe, check out the site. It's just a wealth of information and where you can find Dr. Faber's ongoing, very important work. So without further ado, I want to invite back to the show the legend, the great Dr. Mark Faber. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me on your show. Yeah, it's great to have you back. And um, I have a very special announcement to make uh, here on this program. I had Dr. Faber on back in May of 2014. And Bitcoin back then was trading at around $450. It was in its infancy. Not much was really known about it. And I really had no idea. When I was going to ask Dr. Faber about this, I really didn't know what he was going to say. Because I've known him to be contrarian, kind of, more conservative. Uh, but he just, in his very straightforward manner, said it's a brilliant invention. And I'm like, really? I just thought to myself, I just didn't expect to hear that. And uh, since then, about seven years later, Bitcoin's price reached $68,000. That's a 15,000% return. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a return of monumental proportion, maybe the greatest call, maybe one of the greatest call <laughs> ever in investment. So the point is when Dr. Farber talks investments, you listen. While we're on the subject of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, a lot has happened since then. Uh, the blockchain technology is the real deal. It's really uh, moved. It's con considered a medium of exchange. It's considered an investment, maybe both or one or the other. I read Satoshi's white paper. I mean, it's it was born out of the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, a lot has happened. But the interesting thing is, Dr. Faber, is that when bubbles burst and manias happen, right, you don't see those assets again. They disappear. But Bitcoin, like real estate, like gold, all of them have crashes. It keeps coming back. So this, will you consider this a hard asset? How do you compare it to other hard assets that are out there? And where do you see the cryptocurrency industry and Bitcoin going further from now? Well, I, I think if you have uh, assets that like Bitcoin move up following a financial crisis and the same for gold and other uh, assets such as real estate it's uh, actually a rather sad sign for the value of uh, paper money uh, it shows that uh, basically central banks are either dumb or unwillingly uh, depreciating the value of paper money. In other words, anyone who uh, follows his grandparents' advice to put money in the bank in a savings account is going to lose money because the money, uh, the value of the money will depreciate at a relatively higher rate. And uh, his interest rate is likely to be negative in real terms. By real terms, I mean that, say, at the present time, you could probably get a deposit rate of around 5%. But if inflation is around 8% or 10%, uh, the 5% isn't going to help you very much uh, in five years' time or 10 years' time because the inflation will have been that much higher. So when gold and bitcoins, and it's interesting that uh, they have a different intensity of movements, but the direction is actually quite similar. Uh, if you look at this year, bitcoins went up and gold went up, bitcoins went up more, but they were also more oversold than gold. So I think it's a sign that uh, central banks are actually out to print money. And if I had to make a bet uh, over the next five years or so, 
Will the central banks uh, keep money tight and uh, increase interest rates above the rate of, say, 0% in real terms, inflation adjusted? My bet would be that they will keep interest rates uh, at the low level. I mean, when you think of it, in the 1970s, say in 73, we had a similar rate of inflation as today, but uh, the 10 years treasury bond went already to 12%. Now we're at less than three and a half percent. I mean, we are right? strongly from essentially 0%, but three and a half percent. Uh, if someone came to me and said, Mark, I give you a return of three and a half percent for the next 10 years, I'd say it, it's likely to be unattractive. Yeah. First of all, the government could default. But aside from that, three and a half percent when inflation is, you know, depending how you measure inflation, it has to be somewhere between six percent and 12% for every household. Yes, I just wanted to add that I see Bitcoin more as a medium of exchange than actually a, a <laughs> investment because you know, look at the country of El Salvador. They adopted it actually as their base currency, I think, which is very interesting. Uh, and I also wanted to add, basically, they, they solved the the backlog, you know, the, the, the slow transaction problems that they had uh, with Bitcoin by creating the Lightning Network. So now you have two wallets. You have your main wallet where you keep most of your Bitcoin. Then you have another wallet where you could do small transactions, even micro transactions for just like very, very low fees. And it's very fast. So it, it kind of like solved the problem. The Lightning Network was a game changer. So now you can have a real functioning currency. It's just very interesting. Uh, how this can actually work. So it, it, it's, it's a, I, I'm a believer in it, but I see it more of an immediate of exchange. When people say, oh, we're going to invest and it's an investment as an exchange. As you can see, there's a lot of turmoil going on in this market. You see all these major cryptocurrency exchanges failing. There's people putting their money in there. You know what? You want to invest in Bitcoin, get yourself a wallet, put the money in and follow it yourself. You know, have it in your own hands. Don't put your money somewhere else and then, you know, complain when the place goes out of business or your money is gone or whatever. But anyway, I want to switch to uh, precious metals now, uh, now that we're talking about hard assets. And I have to ask you, how come silver hasn't caught up with the movements of gold? I mean, I'm looking at the history. Silver made this crazy explosive move in 79. Uh, it was just crazy, way past the ratio of movement uh, in gold. But then, you know, in 2011 also, it did. We had gold making near record highs and you had silver at about $48. But then in 2020, last year and this year, you have gold making record highs. I think it did in 2020. And then um, close last year and this year as well. But silver really hasn't caught up. 29 and 2020, 2690 and 2022, around 26 and this year. What is holding the price of silver back in the gold-silver ratio the past few years? Well, uh, I think it's important to understand that although bull and bear markets resemble each other in the sense that in a bull market, assets go up and in a bear market, they go down, uh, every bull market and every bear market is different. I mean, if you look at 1970 to 1981, we have the rise of oil prices and the peak was in 1980 uh, at $50 at the time. And uh, nowadays, Oil went up, but not in this latest move. In this latest move, oil has been weak. So it's difficult to say, well, because in 1979, 1980, silver went ballistic. Why did it not go ballistic now? Ditto for platinum. Platinum in 1980 sold at twice the gold price. 
Now it sells at half the gold price. You understand? If you want to use your argumentation, uh, you will not understand uh, many things that are happening. My interpretation is that the economy is not as strong as people uh, want you to believe. I mean, the Biden administration, they will they will lie about everything. This, I want your viewers to understand. Don't ever trust and believe anything the governments will tell you. The economy could be in a recession. They will still paint a beautiful picture and say GDP is expanding. When the reality is that for most people, the standards of living are going down because their wages are going up less than the cost of living. And in this weak economic environment, economic sensitive commodities like zinc and nickel and copper and silver and platinum and palladium don't perform as well as gold. Uh, because there's economic factors. They're more industrial metals, right? Than gold is. Correct. Yeah. But this is what I think. This is, I'm not the Bible. <laughs> you understand? I'm not the Old Testament. I, I don't know for sure. But this is my thought because it does also cross my mind. How come platinum is so low relative to gold? How come agricultural commodities are so low relative to gold? Because, of course, coffee and wheat is not, you can, you can store it. But it's difficult for an individual to store a million dollars in wheat and corn uh, unless he has a warehouse in his apartment building. <laughs> so you can store it somewhere in, a, in the guest uh, bedroom or so. But gold is a storable commodity. On very small space, you can store a million dollars. That's a very good point. Yeah, I mean, even if you had a storage house for coffee and wheat, it's perishable. So, you know, how long could you store it? Yes, precisely. That's the point. It's perishable. Yeah. Gold has some value because if your building uh, burns down, the gold doesn't burn down. It will still be there. So what do you say? Your to art investors? collection yeah. will burn down, and your books will burn down, and so forth. But the the gold will still be there. Silver, ditto. Yeah, that's true. I, that's a good point. I, I also wanted to ask you. Uh, last time I had you on, you mentioned uh, you made a very good point. You said that gold, precious metals don't have a liability, and and that, that's a good point because you don't have to worry about balance sheets and growth and employees and the economy and competition. You know, it's it's kind <laughs> of like easier to forecast. Well, it's not easy, but you know, you, you can. It's a process of elimination with an investment, and uh, yeah. And, and also, I just wanted to say, uh, you don't have to be wedded to the business. I mean, a long-term investment. You have a you buy a business. That's what a stock is, and you have to hold on to it. You have to believe in it, and you have to go through all the, the pitfalls and everything else. Uh, so, I wanted to ask you. I personally, I use uh, options. I, I put on credit spreads with high deltas and I do this for some passive income because there's just too much uncertainty, Mark. You know, the, I don't know where the markets are going. They're very volatile. There's a lot of pressure. You have the Fed, everything. The markets are slave to the Fed. Oh, what are they going to say? Is rates going to go up a quarter of a percent, a half a percent, three quarters? There's too many factors today that affect market movements as opposed to maybe a long time ago. And the economy is much broader. So my, the reason I like options is because less liability because they expire. <laughs> so at least when they expire, I can collect premium and I don't have to be wedded to something that's long term. So my question to you is, what do you think about options as an investment? Have you used them? Do you have any opinion on it? Your thoughts? Yes, I, I mean, it's interesting. I witnessed the introduction of listed options in 1974. Wow. Yeah. This was a, an innovation. And the first options that they traded 
where I think on gold and silver and then uh, on treasury bonds and uh, in 77 and on uh, on S&P futures. But uh, I'd like to say this. Of course, you can make a lot of money by buying uh, naked options. In other words, you buy a call or you buy a put and you hope the market will move into the direction that uh, would be favorable for your investments. I occasionally own uh, positions in stocks or in uh, gold, and I may sell some options against it. Say, if the covered gold calls, price, right? Covered calls. Covered calls. But I don't do it uh, for my entire position because my view is I don't trade gold. I'm not saying tonight uh, gold will rebound or it will go down $100 or it will go up $200. This is largely irrelevant to me. My belief is that central bankers are going to bankrupt the world. They are people who are academic morons. They have studied whatever it is, but not the classical economic theories. They have all these models. They're all hyper academic people. None of them has ever worked in their lives in a business. None of them. They all were students at universities, usually subsidized by probably the government or some socialist NGOs or whatever it is. Then they went and joined uh, government institutions, the Treasury Department or one of the local central banks and so forth. And if they were good at creeping up, and good at creeping up in government is to be incompetent, then you get promoted. The competent people, they keep at the bottom. So at the top, you have all these incompetent people who go and give speeches, uh, none of which make any sense. And uh, they essentially rule the world with their monetary policies. And uh, the, the record of central banks is a complete catastrophe. I mean, they created the Nasdaq bubble in 2000, and then the housing bubble, which bankrupted a lot of poor people because uh, poor people bought a house and they they uh, they bought the house with mortgages and subprime loans. So when the value went down, they were foreclosed upon. And then the houses were empty, and then uh, Blackstone and uh, <laughs> Black Rock, they came in and bought all these homes, and the poor people were on the street. What a wonderful world. And this but is a not to really ever tax the central banks, because the fund managers in uh, America and elsewhere, they all applaud money printing. Because it allows fund managers to be uh, mediocre. But because of money printing, the portfolio will go up. And so their fees go, go up and their performance fee go up. So more, nobody will ever attack central bankers. Yeah, it, it's, you know, but I'm familiar with central bankers. I've met many of them. There's one that uh, was outstanding, was Paul Volcker and Karl Otto Pöhl in Germany. And of course, uh, in terms of economics, Erhard uh, in Germany. And Greenspan was an academic that I leave, leave to him. He was a, a very intelligent, he's a very intelligent man. He's still alive. <laughs> he's very intelligent. But he sold his soul to the devil. <laughs> In other words, uh, he admits himself that he did a lot of things because he was told to do them. Yeah, then he used to be yeah, the, yeah, the government. Yeah. The government appoints the Fed chair. 
So the Fed chair will do what the government tells him to do. Yeah, I, you know, I, I want to move on to, you know, speaking of government, uh, the things that cause anomalies in the market and the pricing of money. I wanted to discuss with you the inverted yield curve. And it hasn't been this inverted since 1981. It's even further inverting this year. And I'm trying to figure it out. A lot of people have many uh, interpretations and in trying to figure out what causes this anomaly. I mean, who would pay a higher interest rate for short-term paper or over long-term paper? It doesn't make any sense. So they're trying to explain that people are pouring money from short-term into long-term paper because they're predicting that the Fed is going to lower interest rates in the future. So Dr. Farber, I'm trying to understand this anomaly because the way I see it now, the Fed is actually doing the opposite. They're raising interest rates to fight a recession rather than usually lowering them, which is what they do in 2020. They basically cut rates to zero. So now they're doing the opposite and they're raising interest rates because listen, if you have to pay $6 for a dozen eggs, and your rent is going up and the price of gas is going up, I mean, that's going to cause a recession. So they have to fight the recession with raising rates as opposed to lowering them. And now they're saying the inverted yield curve is happening because of the fact that people are predicting low interest rates or they're piling money into longer maturity, 10-year uh, bonds, so to speak, so they can lock in an interest rate maybe because they think that it's going to drop. So I, it's really hard to understand this. I mean, what, which way is it going? Is is raising interest rates uh, in a battle to fight the recession, or is it what that's predicting to lower interest rates to fight it? I mean, the way I see it, the economy looks like it's already in a recession. So what's being predicted in the future? If a recession is already here, how can there be a recession in the future? Or is it a worse recession? Uh, because there was already at least three consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, which indicates recession. And of course, last year, the stock market had a really bad year. So that indicates recession. So which is it? Is it a recession? Is it not a recession? And more importantly, if you really study the inverted yield curve and you see the money pouring into long-term securities, is it also fleeing other investments, not just the short-term bonds, but is it fleeing equities? Will it flee real estate? Your thoughts. Well, thank you for your explanation. <laughs> I mean, you don't need to interview me. No, I, I do. I uh, figure think, this out. I, I think, uh, first of all, it's futile to go through life and always trying to understand everything. There are lots of things you will not fully understand, uh, especially when it comes to the behavior of women. But uh, that aside, <laughs> I'd say at the present time, the Fed uh, has finally realized that there is inflation. Uh, they negated this fact for a long time. And they also completely ignored the fact that a symptom of inflation can also be when asset prices go up, like real estate or stocks or bonds and so forth, uh, they focused on the CPI or the PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, and not on asset prices, which is a huge mistake. Anyway, uh, the Fed is increasing rates. Uh, the Investors are all betting that uh, the Fed will stop raising rates and that we will move into a recessionary environment. And so they have their holding bonds, as I said, at less, or treasury bonds at less than three and a half percent. And the yield curve is inverted. Yeah. But as you say, the recession is already here. The question is, uh, how much worse will it get? I think it can get very, <laughs> very bad, <laughs> quite frankly. It can turn out to be disastrous. But i just like to mention, uh, we will soon know the outcome. <clears throat> because the bond market 
if you look at the chart of, say, a long-term bond, you take the TLT ETF. Mm -hmm. is a long-dated treasury ETF. You look at the chart, at the long-term chart, it fell from around 170, it's now around 104, okay? And it's been moving between around the 92 level to 116, 110 over the last few months, say six months. Mm -hmm. And the big move is coming. But a huge move. And it will either be that the TLT rallies, in other words, interest rates fall, or the TLT collapses and interest rates go up on the long end. So you think the Fed is going to pivot at some point? The Fed will always pivot uh, when it comes to some problems and they will print money. And they will, yeah, <laughs> it's not only that they will always print money. They always have to print more and more and more. Otherwise, the system collapses. This has been described in the classical economic literature by Ludwig von Mises mm -hmm. and Hayek, that once you embark on QE1, and I said the day they announced QE1, nonsense, this is not QE1, this is QE infinity. Because once you go on drugs, it's very difficult to get out of it. You have to go into a clinic usually, or you have to have very strong willpower. I know people that came off drugs, but it took a lot of willpower. You look at the Fed governors, they're all cowards, cowards and liars, and they have no guts, and they have no courage, and they will continue to print money. That's for sure. That's the easiest way out. And it doesn't hurt them because they get salary increases, and no matter how bad they are, how incompetent they are, they will get the pensions. A simple businessman, a small businessman, he messes up his business, he goes bankrupt, he has nothing. Nobody will help him. The most incompetent people are r running the world nowadays, the central bankers. Yeah, I mean, speaking of incompetence, uh, I, I would like you to put your geopolitical hat on. And uh, I would like to ask you about what's going on with this uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, because it's obviously affecting energy prices and uh, economic, uh, you know, economic activity that's taking place, especially in Europe. But I mean, you, you know, they're claiming that this war was unprovoked. I mean, it's not really so, because what I'm looking at, I see NATO aggressively expanding east when they said they wouldn't. And uh, they claim this is the reason, and if, you know, they, they, they invaded because there is a humanitarian crisis in the Donbass region and the eastern part of Ukraine. So as far as the way I look at it, do you see this as one of the most dangerous times that we're living today? I mean, the, you know, Russia is no Afghanistan or Iraq. This is a major world power. I mean, they have a lot of sophisticated weapons, they have nuclear weapons, and then they're messing with China at the same time. You know, the thing that's going on with Taiwan and it's kind of it seems like it's pushing them closer together. So isn't isn't aren't they looking for the opposite to happen? I mean, what's your take on this and how, how do you see this ending? Yeah, I wish I knew how it will end. I mean, Einstein was asked once at the dinner, you know, what do you think will be the outcome of the Third World War? He said that I don't know. But the next world war will be fought with uh, forks <laughs> and, uh, and uh, knives. I mean, my sense is, to anyone observing uh, geopolitical conditions around the world, some people at the State Department, they wanted to go to war with Putin very clearly they essentially forced his hand 
and uh, then war he attacked, but he was so, sort of uh, forced to attack. Anyway, now we're in the situation, it's it's interesting. I was watching the other day a documentary about the Battle of of the Somme. The, at the Somme, uh, thousands and thousands, I mean, hundreds of thousands of troops were opposing each other in trenches. On the one side, the well-defended uh, and fortified lines of the Germans. On the other side, the French and the English. <laughs> and the English general commander, he... Uh, he uh, issued the order to attack. The people that attacked the Germans were mostly recruits. They had a training of like three or four months in Britain. They had no fighting experience whatsoever. They had to walk out, climb out of the trenches and walk into the machine gun fires. And within days, hundreds of thousands of people were dead. And the general... He was sitting comfortably in a chair r far removed from the front line. You understand these murderers who ordered the people to go to war. They sit in comfortable ar armchairs in Washington and in other com countries. They are not fighting in the front line. At least Alexander the Great, he had the courage. He fought in the front line. He was the king of Greece. He was in the front line. But do you see Victoria Nuland in the front line anywhere? Or Hunter Biden? They are in the back line collecting uh, corruption money. <laughs> Generally, you could just see that the government, it appears, has created a very unproductive, non-working society, rewarding people for not working. I mean, you see the obesity rate in the United States, it's almost 50%. I mean, that means people are not productive. Uh, you have the education system being run by the government, so they're indoctrinated into, into thinking like, let's say, authoritarian presidents are great presidents, while presidents that left their hands off the economy, such as like Martin Van Buren, you know, he's not even talked about that much, right? So... My question to you is, do you see that the government is, is causing members of society to be unproductive as opposed to other countries like China and Southeast Asia, where they get things done? They produce, they're productive. You look throughout Walmart shelves and everywhere else, auto parts. I mean, just about everything you can think of, furniture. It's made in China, made in Southeast Asia. They're productive. And they call China mm -hmm. communist and the United States is capitalist. I mean, I don't understand that. Could you please explain your thoughts? Well, uh, I don't want to compare the U.S. necessarily with other countries. But uh, it's very obvious to anyone who observes, uh, say, historical trends that if you look at the 19th century, and nowadays, they always talk negatively about the robber barons and, you know, the railroad uh, people who constructed the railroads and the canals and uh, the automobiles later on and so forth. And the food industry, they always talk negatively about these people. But these people, they put up industries. And as a result of the uh, productivity they uh, improved, the cost of products went down. In other words, say in the US, transportation costs from the East Coast to the West Coast in 1900 were a fraction of what they had been in 1800. And so the overall standards of living were lifted enormously for everybody mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, of course under the influence of uh, Marx Karl Marx more and more government cre crept into the economy in other words 
None of the European countries nor the US in 1910 had spending, government spending of more than 10% of GDP. That was government was small, 10% of the economy. Now, in some countries, it's 60% or more. And of course, this is a, it, it's a creeping socialism and uh, authoritarian rule where uh, the government has more and more power. You take Corona as an example. Uh, no government in history before has ever locked in people. <laughs> this happened <laughs> under democratically elected despots. <laughs> yeah, they're all another, dictators. Yeah. They're, they're democratically elected, but they behave like dictators with the bureaucracy. And everybody says, well, I'm only uh, acting according to my instructions and to my orders and so forth. But uh, they impose very radical methods on people and restrict people's freedom. And of course, the, the government is like a cancer. The more it spreads in the economy, the more the economy uh, will, or the less chance the economy has to grow. Socialism is built on an ideology of redistributing wells and it will destroy wells it's a ideology or a philosophy as some people think it is of destruction and you only have to look at the history of the bolshevik revolution in russia what happened is uh, in russia under the tsar the farmers the farm owners were a relatively affluent class. Then the bureaucrats came in, the Bolsheviks, and they took the farms away. And what happened, farm production collapsed and mass starvation followed. But this, 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 this didn't disturb the bureaucrats. They couldn't care less. Yeah, I just wanted to close. And so I'm telling you, if the U.S. and we in the Western world do not wake up and uh, recognize all these measures that the government is taking, also this ideology of climate change and so forth, I'm all in favor of looking after the environment. But if you have to look after the environment, and the consequence is that the standards of living of all people goes down yeah, yeah. and that people lose their freedom, then I think it is counterproductive. Yeah, I just wanted to close. You, you, you make a very good point. Uh, you talk about the robber barons. You have Carnegie and Vanderbilt, right? People like Henry Ford. They didn't need government subsidies to sell their products. They had plenty of demand. You know, the demand is there, and then you you, you have, you could create your products. <laughs> Henry Ford came up with the assembly line. You know, there was plenty of demand for cars. It was, a, it was a revolution. So now you have government subsidizing electric cars. They give you tax tax money and a tax credit to buy it. Well, why? Because they want to force it upon you, or else otherwise you wouldn't buy them. So this is the, the distortions that I'm talking about, Dr. Farber. So tax subsidies continue for all these new types of uh, things that they have like uh, green energy and electric cars. I mean, th th these things will just fail. And they have like Solyndra and Cash for Clunkers and all these other government programs that they had. The question is, will this ever stop? And will the economy be left alone to function on its own? Well, it will stop once the economy is so bad that the rich people lose a lot of their money. Then they'll wake up because at the present time, all these subsidies and government spending, uh, the ruling class actually benefits from it because uh, there's this crony capitalistic system. So you encourage actually government spending because you know once the government spends money, it will flow towards you anyway. 
if you're Walmart, you hand out food stamps, you know they're going to come back to you. <laughs> so, uh, but there will be a tipping point where the wealthy people lose a lot of money. And at that time, they'll wake up. Most likely it will be too late, but uh, it will happen. But in my view, it's inevitable. We have statistics, not mine, but actually produced by the research department at the Federal Reserve. They show clearly someone who is 35 years old today, he earns less and has less money than his, his parents when they were 35. We are in the first generation of people in the Western world that, have, that will have a lower standard mm -hmm. of living than their parents. And now you ask me, when will it stop? I don't know when it will stop. The fact is that already today, young people have a lower standard of living than their parents had, and then they claim that the economy is growing. No, it's not growing. It's contracting in real terms, but because of inflation, and uh, your viewers should make no mistake, inflation is a tax, period. Yes, yes. It's an invisible tax. That's why the governments love it. If you increase taxation, uh, the tax rate on your salary, everybody's pitching. But in inflationary times, they don't think that it's the government. They think it's inflation because of Putin or the evil mullahs in Iran or the Chinese. Oh, I don't know who. <laughs> Dr. Faber. Trump. It's because of Trump. <laughs> okay, Dr. Faber, it's been so enlightening. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Okay, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. And all, right. all the best. And keep your gold. Don't sell too many options. <laughs> <laughs> well, after the calls that right. you've been making lately, I have to listen more to you, you know. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you for your time. <laughs>